Welcome everybody joining us. Welcome again to everyone joining us. We hope you are all doing well. I'm also recording now into the cloud. Perfect. So today we're in our nameless study session Wednesday morning again, and continuing a topic that many people thought we would only need 15 minutes of one session as opposed to two sessions plus. Uh, we're do it, talking about Jews and sports. We also talked about the Maccabi games, which is uh, obviously really interesting. The ones that are held in Israel and the ones for youth held uh, every year or so in the U.S. regionally. What we're going to talk about today is some of the Jews and some of the sports we did not talk about last time. Last time we talked about Jews and boxing, baseball. We talked about uh, a few of the more interesting characters like Agnes Coletti, who was, of course, uh, a great Jewish gymnast, as many others have been, Carrie Strug. Uh, there's been ice skaters. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, two sports that are very popular today and were less so in older days. Now, when we talk about Jews dominating sports, really, there's only one sport that Jews completely dominate, and that would be boxing. Boxing in the early days of, of the 20th century, Jews were really in every division except for the heavyweight division doing really well. We had basically champions in every division. We did even have one heavyweight champion later on in the 30s. There were some restrictions for who could be heavyweight champion after um, Jack Johnson, who was the African-American uh, heavyweight champion in the 19 teens died, but it really didn't matter that much to Jews because we generally are a little bit smaller and certainly were then. So we didn't have that many who could actually compete, but we did have the one heavyweight champion. We talked about Max Baer. We talked about Benny Leonard, probably the greatest Jewish boxer and probably one of the greatest Jewish boxers of all time. But if you take out boxing there is another sport that Jews may not have dominated, but did really well, and at times maybe even have dominated in the early days of the sport. And we're talking in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, going into 1950s. Amazingly, as with boxing, it is a sport you wouldn't assume that Jews did very well at, mostly because of our height, and that is basketball. But it's really interesting to see that Jews were a dominant force at every level of basketball from almost its infancy uh, until the 1950s. And then after the 1950s, there's still a lot of coaches and owners and executives, obviously. But beyond the most famous one, which is, of course, you know, Red Arbach, as everybody's heard of, there were a lot of Jews who had a really big part to play in the history of boxing and I'm sorry, history of basketball. So we're going to go over some of those. Uh, certainly, if you've heard of any of them, you may have heard of Dolph Shays, who's probably the greatest Jewish basketball player, probably one of the two or three best basketball players of the 1950s. But if we go back earlier to the 1920s, there is two teams in the 1920s that are the most famous in many ways dominated. And can anybody name either one of them? Well, the Globetrotters. One would be the Harlem Globetrotters. The other would be the original Celtics. Now the original Celtics are actually a New York based team. So they have nothing to do with the later Boston Celtics, except for obviously the Celtics took their name from them. But in the 1920s, when they first started the ABL, kind of the original, one of the original professional teams, the original Celtics were so dominant that at times teams refused to play them because they were so good. And this is, so they played some of the time in the ABL American basketball league and won the championship. Uh, I think two out of the three years or they were in the league. And then they also were a road team where they'd go and take on teams around the country and one year, they went 193, 11, and 1. Sure. So as you can see, um, they were one of the two great teams of the 1922-23 season with the Franklin Wonder Five, who did refuse to play them. They were completely dominant. 
and were almost exclusively Jewish. The most famous name, maybe somebody familiar more as a coach, would be Nat Holman. Some call him Nate. He was one of their top players. He would go on to coach at CCNY, where he'd win the NIT, the National Invitational Tournament, and the NCAA Tournament in the same year, and it's never been done since. At that time, the NIT was as important as the NCAA. Right now, it's, it's, no, it's not. The NIT is the, is the tournament that the teams that don't get into the major tournament go to. Um, but it also had other greats, Joe Lapchick and John Beckman, who was kind of the maybe the best player of that era. He was known as the George, I mean, basically Babe Ruth of, of, um, of basketball. Uh, Pete Berry and Davey Banks. So those were the, and George Haggerty. Those were the main players for this team that dominated and they were all Jewish. Now you might ask yourself, why would Jews dominate this sport? Well, one, it was in its infancy. So we're not talking a big money sport at this time. Two, and tell me if this sounds familiar to you, a lot of poor Jews couldn't afford to be playing baseball, which was the national sport or football. So all you had to do was put some cement down and two hoops and a ball and you could play. So all these inner city Jews who were poor could play basketball. Sound familiar to what's going on in the world today. It's really became a game that you can uplift yourself. And so this is how players like Nat Holman and Johnny Beckman began to dominate. Now on the other side of the coin, there was another team, as mentioned, which is Harlem Globetrotters, which, of course, is still around today. Today, they are a, you know, world traveling comedy team. And we know that they they've they've really, you know, played in front of millions and millions. I think we've all probably seen. I know McAllen, Texas, my hometown, they came and played, which was not a major thoroughfare. So they went around the world. But in the 1920s, they were actually a traveling basketball team. The comedy doesn't come till late. The comedy comes in many respects because they were so good and people didn't want to play them and lose to them. So obviously this was the Harlem Globetrotters, African-American guys. However, the coach, not the founder, but the guy who took over and really made them a name was Abe Saperstein, who was one of these originally poor Jewish boys who loved basketball. And so the two dominant teams of the area that were traveling teams were both in many ways, Jewish in many respects. However, although Abe Saperstein and uh, of course um, the original Celtics were important, there's another person who comes out of that era along with all of the Jewish uh, players. And his name is Eddie Gottlieb. I don't know if you've heard of Eddie Gottlieb. 76ers. Yeah, exactly. Well, before that, the Warriors. Um, he was a Jewish guy who loved basketball and he would become a, a, a decent coach, but really more of a promoter. Um, one of the great promoters to really help basketball become what it was in the 1920s and 30s. And, um, you know, he was one of the people who helped begin the ABL, the American Basketball League, and, in 1925. And the basketball teams, they actually the, the Philadelphia team where he would end up coaching was funny enough, um, sponsored by Jewish boxing promoters, you know, because obviously boxing was the major sport for Jews at that time where they could play or participate. So Eddie Gottlieb was one of these people who really became the preeminent promoter for professional backs basketball through the 1930s and late 20s, uh, at times owning teams, at times promoting them, and really continued to do this all the way to the 1940s. And as we know, or many of us know, in the 1940s is when the NBA was founded. So when the NBA was founded, he ended up being the uh, was it the owner, the owner of the coach, the owner coach of the Philadelphia Warriors? And if you've not heard of that name, they would become eventually the Golden State Warriors. 
And so they just happened to be the team that won the first NBA championship in 1947. So, but not only was he big, there were a lot of other Jewish players in the late 1940s, include not just him, but of course, probably the most famous at that time besides him, I mean, to Jewish leaders, Max Zavlosky, who was one of the great players for Chicago, who Eddie Gottlieb's team beat in the 1947 finals, uh, the Chicago Stags, uh, which is not the Chicago Bulls. Uh, it's actually went defunct and, and Chicago got on the team later. But so in the very first NBA championship, which at the time was called the BAA, uh, the Warriors beat the Stags. And of course, there were Jewish players on both teams. So if you think of a great Jewish play, a great player in Chicago history, funny enough, Chicago basketball was not a very popular thing. The team would be defunct. It would be a team would come back. Uh, I think we can all understand when Chicago basketball became very popular in Chicago. It is not a does not take a genius to figure out it's in the 1980s that uh, Chicago becomes a basketball town. But until then, they were not. But a lot of the players in the late 40s, when this all was started, were Jews. And in fact, the one of the original Philadelphia teams was called the Philadelphia SFAS, which was an acronym for South Philadelphia Hebrew Association. And they would play in ballrooms. And then some of these players were became the first NBA players. And so Eddie Gottlieb was owner coach for a lot of these championship teams with the Saws before they became the NBA. Now, eventually in some places um, like um, I think New York, for instance, the New York team got rid of all their Jews because all of the fans were Irish. So they, they play at Madison Square Garden and their own team would be booed because there were so many Jews playing. So they had to get rid of the Jews so that they could be cheered and they ended up playing for other teams. So this would happen and you would have tons of players and uh, coaches, but not only that, the first league president was Maurice Podoloff, who was also Jewish. He was a Jewish lawyer from uh, Ukraine, I think. And he was the president of both the NHL and the NBA. So we basically went from the NHL to the NBA. He may still have been the only person to be the president of two major sports leagues, which is probably not likely to happen again, because you really have to really pigeon yourself to get in. So with players like Jerry Fleshman, Petey Rosenberg, and, 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 and uh, Ralph Kaplowitz. There were some pretty well-known players, not as good as Max Slosky or, of course, Dolph Shaves. But between them, between Eddie Gottlieb and, and Maurice Podoloff, you had a lot of Jewish people in the NBA in its early days, which is really amazing. And as I said, Gottlieb was a very, was, he ended up being a mediocre coach. And he would later say why he became a mediocre coach is because he cared more about promoting basketball than winning. So if his team was ahead, he wouldn't slow down the game. He would make him run faster because he wanted people to enjoy it. He's the guy who got rid of, got, invented the 24 second clock because if a weaker team was playing a superior team, they would just hold the ball the whole time and you end up with scores like 16-15. And he thought that was bad for the game, which was in its professional infancy in terms of the NBA. But you would also have more famous figures. The most famous would be, of course, Red Arbach, who is uh, arguably one of the, not arguably one of the greatest, arguably the greatest coach. Obviously, others could be up there, but he was, of course, the coach of the Boston Celtics in the 50s and 60s. Then he became the general manager all the way through uh, the last Boston championship with him in 1986. So he won, I think, at one point, nine out of 10 or eight out of nine championships. Wow. As a, uh, and then he went wow. he managed, he became the owner 
and he won three or four or five more. So I think he was part of maybe like 16 championships, maybe 15, 16. He certainly smoked a lot of cigars. Yes, and he was famous because <laughs> he would light his cigar when he thought the game was over. And uh, that was what he became very famous for. Larry Brown, of course, we all have heard of, a very famous coach. He's the only coach, I think, still to win an NBA championship and an NCAA championship. Of course, he coached um, Kansas. And, 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 and well, who did he coach the NBA championship? Was it San Antonio one year? And then Red Holtzman is another famous one. He is the last person to coach a New York team to New York, the New York Knicks to the championship, which was in yeah. the 70s. One time ago. Yeah. The, the New York has not had a champion in a while, though I don't pay attention to basketball anymore. I stopped paying attention about 15 years ago, but I don't think they've had a championship. Did the Brooklyn win it one year? Didn't Brooklyn win it two years no. ago? No. The finals. They got to the no. finals. They got to the, oh, the finals. Year, All right. I don't pay attention to you know, anything pre-2000. But he coached the Knicks, and of course, that Knicks team was, uh, you know, won in 70, I think 70 and 73, or 71, 70 and 73, I think. And, and um, that was the last New York team to win the NBA championship, which is pretty bad, actually. That's, that's 50 years. Ouch. Rabbi? Yeah. Rabbi, question. Did Eddie Gottlieb bring on Julia Serving? Was he the one that brought, because that kind of revolutionized the whole play of the league? You know, I don't think so, because I think he had died by then. I think he died like a year or two before Julie Serving came to the NBA. I could be wrong. So Julie Serving was originally recruited to the ABA, although the NBA wanted him. And then he went to the NBA in like 1979, 1980, I think a year or two after Gottlieb died. But I'll have to check that. That's a good question. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if um, it was. He, he died in 1979. So it would have been right around that age. That he may have been influential in getting him onto the self. I mean, everybody wanted Julius Irving. I mean, he was he was the Michael Jordan of the 70s, even though he played in the ABA. Because um, that changed the whole style of basketball. Oh, yeah. I mean, if he, had, if he had gone straight into the NBA, he would be considered – probably just under Michael Jordan, but he played several years in a lesser league. So those statistics don't cross over, but he was definitely in the Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan. Now the most, the best player of all time, of course, is Dolph Shays, who is a New York guy. His son actually, Danny Shays played for a few years, mostly as a backup, but Dolph oh. Shays played uh, for many years in the NBA in the 1950s. He played for the Syracuse nationals. And he led them to the championship in 1955, I believe. And what is interesting about that game is you talk about tough players. He played in the finals with not one, but two broken arms. Both his arms were broken. And he still played and led them to the championship. Probably derailed his career a bit afterwards, but that's what he's famous. You know, you talk about the most impressive you know, you talk about Michael Jordan getting the flu and, but this is, I mean, he played with two broken arms in the championship series and they won. So that was really what stood him out. Although he was still one of the best players of the fifties, probably could be up at, as high as number two after George Mikan. So, but uh, Jeff. I got the pleasure to see him play a couple of times in person. Uh, really? Against the Rochester Royals. <laughs> When they were around. <laughs> oh wait, was he on the Rochester Royals? I think he was. No, 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 no. They played no, no. against. They played the Rochester oh, Royals. Yeah, because no. the Syracuse Nationals actually became, I think, the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, but yeah, he was. I mean, he was a great player. And there's been a, there was a lot of debate. It was interesting. There was a lot of debate at the time as to why Jews were so good in basketball in the 20s and 30s. There was even views that it was genetic. There were views that it was very organized uh, because it was so organized and you had to be able to know what everybody was doing at the same time. So talking about the genetics usually are used to hamper us physically. This was one of the few times it was used to, um, you know, support 
Now, again, obviously, by the 1960s, uh, things were changing. There were going to be as many Jewish basketball players. But what was really interesting is one of the reasons so many African-Americans were able to come into the league is due to people like Podoloff and Eddie Gottlieb. I forgot which of the two. Um, it was uh, one of them. One of them encouraged the Harlem Globetrotters to play professional NBA teams, including the champions. Now, most leagues, this would have never been allowed. An African-American team playing the league champion, because obviously what will what will happen is if this team beats the league champion, it's really embarrassing. So obviously there were baseball players in the off season would play against the Negro league players, but nothing official. And Eddie Gottlieb and I think Max Podoloff were trying to promote the NBA and they allowed the Harlem Grove Trotters to play the, the champion uh, and the Harlem Globe Trotters actually won. And that, was one of the things that led to them bringing in African-American basketball players in the 50s. I think Chuck Tarzan Cooper was the first one, maybe with the Celtics. Um, I think it was uh, Nat Sweetwater Clifton. And, and, and he was the other. I was, Nat Sweetwater Clifton was the other. It was one of those two. They were, yeah, I think it's a debate as to who, which of those two. But a lot of it had to do with the Jewish owners allowing the, the Globetrotters to play these teams in an age, you know, that it was not always uh, allowed. So, um, so that's, that's pretty much interesting. Actually the, the, I think the NBA championship cup is named after Podoloff and the rookie of the year is named after Gottlieb. Like the, the, that's how important they are. So the Champions Cup or the MVP is named after Podoloff and the Rookie of the Year is named after um, uh, Eddie Gottlieb. So here it is. I couldn't remember the year. It was 1948 where the Globetrotters had won 100 games in a row. And Max Winter, who was the Jewish owner of the Minneapolis Lakers, which was the dominant team in the 50s, and Saperstein decided to invite the Globetrotters to play the Lakers, and the Globetrotters won. And that was the 1950s, and very soon afterwards, obviously, uh, African-American players started to play for the NBA. So even today, there's been a couple NBA players here and there, although not, but there's still been some coaches and actually owners. Um, but really, there was a lot for, and then of course, if you go to Israel, one of the great Israeli athletes of all time was Tal Brody. And Tal Brody uh, was basically the best player in Israeli history. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was, you know, basically after his playing days, he became really one of the leaders in Israel basketball. But he... Um, he led the U.S. to a gold medal in the 1965 Maccabi Games after playing at Illinois. And he was invited then to play for Maccabi Tel Aviv, and he decided to do it. Decided to do that instead of try and go pro or do something else. Does anybody guess who, 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 who recruited him to play for Maccabi Tel Aviv? Moshe Dayan. Oh, really? Wow. Moshe Dayan came to him and recruited him to play when obviously – you know, basketball was so he got his master's and he decided to play in Israel and obviously became the top player. And of course, in probably the first great moment in Israel sports history, led Maccabi Tel Aviv to the European Championship, which was a big deal. You know, except for outside of the United States, that was the biggest championship was the European cup and he led Maccabi uh, and they've won it. I think one or I think they won it one more time later. So, um, and again, later on, he became a promotion, you know, a promoter and, um, and funny enough, 
they were supposed to host the final, that the that final. They were the host team. However, Russia refused to go to Israel to play them. So they had to play in Belgium. So how many times will the host team give up their home court advantage? Um, and but the, you know, but Russia has, you know, no, has, you know, they they've got no issues with in, they've never had issues in any other way in, in the history of sports, though. So that's that was the one time that the Soviet Union or Russia had some shenanigans in sports. The only time <laughs> that was that was sarcasm. OK, <laughs> yes, I caught it. <laughs> oh, thanks, Jeff. One person got it. Even if you're not following the Winter Olympics, you should at least know that, you know, the last Winter Olympics. Was it the wow. last one? Uh, no, two Winter Olympics ago when Russia hosted the Olympics, they had the greatest opioid sports shenanigans in history. Um, they, do you guys know what happened? They, they dug holes into, the, the, wall. into the, the walls where they test, they built a building right next to where they tested the athletes for uh, doping. And so they had holes in the walls so they could actually put in somebody else's uh, pee to get tested. So not a single Russian athlete tested for steroids or any other uh, type of doping in that Olympics. And they dominated. So they just got caught doing it again. Yeah, well, they got caught doing it. And that's what caused them to be banned and a lot, a lot of other things. Yeah, but they were never banned. They Russia was banned, so they have to compete as like the Russia cooperative. So they still compete. Yes. So they're not, it, it, and they're not supposed to have a flag, but they had it right. anyway. So basically, there was no no issues. They got completely right. scot off free. Basically, yeah, they just had to change the name. Uh, Flossie. Did Tom Brody bring basketball in a way to Israel or was before. it very much there before? It was there before, but he's the one who popularized. We got to remember in the 1960s, basketball was not that popular of a sport. It was a distant fourth after baseball, football, and hockey. Basketball doesn't really become a popular sport. In fact, at times it looked like it was going to go under. It really doesn't become a popular sport till the 1980s with Larry Bird and Mike and Magic Johnson. And then it goes to another level with Michael Jordan. Uh, Michael, then Flossie. Oh, Flossie, then Michael. Such a I, just, I, I don't know how far you're going to go in basketball, but I, I we were going to go to a different mention, sport. Uh, but what's your. I, I do want to mention Ernie Grunfeld. Who, oh, yeah. Another great player. Yes. And, and he was. You know, and then he became an executive and all right. that, but that's that's only part of it. Uh, uh, I think this might interest some people. His his son, his mother, Ernie Grunfeld's mother, is a Holocaust survivor, and um, his son, whose name is Dan, uh, I don't know whether it's recent. I just recently found out about it. Uh, wrote a book uh, called uh, "Grace of the Game." A lot of it deals is about his grandmother, and um, I forgot her name, but uh, but you can look it up on Google if, if you're at all interested. And what what was more interesting to me was that uh, through this you can find a site that has oral interviews of, of Holocaust survivors. And, oh really? Uh, and on on a personal note, I, I found a uh, an interview with my mother-in-law that. We didn't know anything about. Huh, that's and, awesome. Uh, was it? Is it through the Shaw Foundation? It's well, you know that that's the interesting thing. It it the the uh, the mask uh, says the uh, Holocaust Museum. It doesn't say the Shaw Foundation. No, so it's all about one in Israel or America. No, the Hol not, not Yad Vashem. The the one in Washington. The one in America, um, yeah, in Washington. Yeah, yeah, um, and. Uh, you can, you know, the the, uh, the Spielberg's uh, stuff, Shoah Foundation. You know, you you access is kind of limited. You have to get permissions to hear some of the tapes. But whatever interviews this group did, uh, if you know a name and you type it in, you can get the interview. 
So mm, that's interesting. What it's worth, and I, I don't remember her name. I think it's it's Lily Grunfeld. But if you if you Google Dan uh, Grunfeld or Ernie Grunfeld, you'll you'll eventually get there. So I just wanted to mention that. I think it's it was interesting. I might yeah, even he was a great player. I think he was the first ABA rookie of the year, maybe. I think so because I think he was the AB first. Uh, that yeah, well that's awesome. That's an interesting look up. Uh, uh, Flossie, and you're on mute. Okay, are we on? Yes. Okay, you're on. Was fencing a Jewish sport? Because I know there was that movie showing the fencer in Europe, and I don't know if fencing was a Jewish sport. That's a good question. Um, I've never really studied anything about fencing. That'd be interesting. I don't know if any Jews have won gold medals at fencing. I'll have to look yes. it up. Yes, they have. Hungarian did. Um, there was that um, movie Sonnenberg. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Let me see if I have that. I don't know. Larry would know the movie about. Sunshine. So there was it. A... Sunshine, I think Sunshine. they called it. The movie's but name Sonnenberg. was Sunshine, but it was about Sonnenberg, Sonnenberg family in Hungary, and uh, he became the world champion. Uh, and when the Germans start, and in order to fence for the world championship, I think he had to convert to Catholicism, uh, but that did not save him, of course, in the yeah. Holocaust. He was rounded up, taken to a camp, and actually died under some oh, really? pretty bad torture. Um, but it was, a, it was a very good movie. I think the movie was called Sunshine. Larry, do you know what one I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah, he was uh, um, actually he was a World War One veteran and he believed I think there was something about being a veteran of World War One also that uh, he felt um, he had an exemption, even though he was Jewish and he felt that he was German more than he was, um, you know, um, Jewish. And he felt right. that uh, he showed his medal, I remember, during the movie to the Nazis. And they just kind of threw it on the ground and said, uh, you know, we're not abiding by that ruling anymore. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. but uh, as far as Jewish fencers, I think, um, and, and I may be wrong on this, but uh, in the Nazi Olympics of 1936, um, the Nazis did permit one Jewish participant to show the world that they were conciliatory. Um, and I think it was a Jewish woman who was a fencer. I remember the them trying the one. I remember the one person. But, and so, again, like you said, there's a wide variety of Jews who've done. I mean, if you go to other sports, uh, track and field, I think we'll just go through a few other sports and we'll go to football. Harold Abrahams, of course. Um, won the 100 yard, 100 meter dash or 100 yard dash in the 1924 Olympics. He be, it became very famous because obviously of the movie Chariots of Fire, which dealt with the oh, oh, yeah. issues he faced as a Jew and as somebody who tried to professionalize track and field. Um, obviously, in gymnastics, we talked about Agnes Scaletti, we didn't talk about Ali Raisman or Mitch Gaylord. Um, we look at ice skating, Sasha Cohen. We you know, haven't had time. We, we can't talk about everything and talk about all of the great sportscasters, which is obviously in many ways been dominated by Jews and continues to be a very popular place for Jews. And women's basketball, Nancy Lieberman, who may be the greatest women's basketball player of all time. Uh, obviously, Lieberman, she sounds Jewish and she is Jewish. And baseball, we talked about a few of the players, but there's been so many Cal Abrams, in some of them. And some of the new ones, I don't know a lot of the new players, but I do know Sean Green and Brad Ospras. And uh, but there's a Ryan Braun, obviously, is, is, is a, a current one. And so those are some of the, the players from one of these sports. Now, some of the sports that are well, less. I didn't want to mention one other track. And oh, field. sure. Please. That was in the 36 Olympics was the big controversy during the relay race and it's still a little bit unknown and uh, that was the one that marty glickman and another jewish fellow right. was supposed to race and um it, it's unclear whether or not there was nazi pressure to take them off it looks like there really wasn't it was more of a combination of the fact that um the, they put in Jesse Owens, actually, who, um, you know, was one of the faster guys, obviously. Uh, but they took out the two Jewish athletes in favor of two of the um, US, uh, California. I think the USC yeah. coach was the track coach at the time. So um, the, the story gets a little bit, uh, you know, um, um, confusing. 
Uh, but it does look like uh, there was no anti-Semitism on the part of the uh, the coach there. It was pretty much that he wanted his own players, and he did want to put in a little bit better play, better um, uh, speeder, speedier guy than um, than Marty Glickman and uh, the other Jewish fellow that ran. So, yeah, that was uh, Sam Stoller. Yeah, Sam Stoller. Yeah, but it's and interesting. There's a documentary about a lot of these. I'm going to take issue with that, Larry, and I I, I think we could we could spend at least an hour talking about anti-Semitism within the American Olympic Committee. Oh, right. that's a totally and different I, issue. You're right. There well, was terrible anti-Semitism because, yeah. But, yeah. I think, but I think Glickman's, the, the issue uh, with Glickman was in part because of Brundage, who, you know, if he, if he wasn't a Nazi, he was certainly a Nazi sympathizer. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I, I think he had as much to do with uh, Glickman not running as, as anything else that he. But there were there was, were, I think, something like about a dozen Jewish athletes that came with the U.S. team. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that there were many Jewish athletes that right. did compete. It seemed to be more of a, an, a, an incident between the two coaches, the coaches from, um, you know, the East Coast versus the coach who was the track team Coast. coach, who was the USC track team coach. And he put his two players in at the uh, at the time. Um, so I don't know. It, it's confusing. It's, uh, yeah, and it's hard to know because you know it's right. not. It doesn't get as much press because they actually won. They won that race. If they had lost, um, then that may have been uh, you know a bigger issue. But yeah, who knows if it was one way or the other? But they had these, you know. So there's evidently been a lot of these issues with Jewish. Well, and that right about anti-Semitism because you know the Jews did try to uh, boycott actually that just not because of this but because of the uh, the Nazi oh, right, movement of, and yeah. having it actually in right. uh, in Berlin they were very much against sending the Olympic Committee there and Brundage went over there on some kind of a um, uh, an investigatory mission and he found out yeah, yeah everything was cool. okay <laughs> they cleaned up yeah, the city all good and, yeah, these are good people started. here. He may have even got, he was in the building construction business as well. And he may have even gotten a contract, they thought, for some kind of an embassy in New York, which never, uh, not in New York, in Washington, which never really materialized. Yeah, he was definitely a sketchy fella. Yeah, he's the one actually also that um, he came in, um, I think, second or third to Jim Thorpe in the um, decathlon or whatever it was called at that time. And it was two, there was two, it was two different ones. There was yeah, a and he refused to, um, uh, I guess it was under his guidance as Olympic to reinstate Jim Thorpe's medal and he refused to do it as well. <laughs> so uh, he, he's got quite a checkered past. And <laughs> I don't know if he was a good checkered player or not. <laughs> but there's, uh, there's been others. So some of the less less famous, uh, I don't know if you guys, in the 1980s, in racquetball, there was a guy named Marty Hogan, who was a Jewish guy. It was like the height of the racquetball era. And he was the, probably the best racquetball player of all time. And he was the first racquetball player to really make money as a professional racquetball player. And so he completely dominated. Amy Alcott, of course, a great uh, Jewish golfer. Kenny Bernstein, very famous drag racer. Um, um, you know, I'm not in drag racing, but now swimming, of course, is a, is a sport that we have done very well. Jews have done very well. Most obviously, obvious is Mark Spitz, who competed in the 1968 Olympics and failed miserably. He did win, I think, three gold medals in, he won... I think no, he did not win three. He won how he won I mean, I don't think he won like three medals um and really just flashed out. And then 19, I think he won two gold medals and like one bronze, but they were not in any individual events. And then in 1972, he comes back, and although the record's been broken, he wins seven gold medals and sets seven world records. That that is still, I think. Uh, Michelle Phelps actually won eight gold medals in swimming, but I didn't, he did not set, I, I think he only set like five world records. So he definitely has way more and is a better swimmer. But Mark Spitz set seven world records in seven events and won every event in 1972. And that's, 
One more time. I know. I know she didn't win the Olympics, but was Esther Williams oh, Jewish? Do I know? I don't think Esther Williams was Jewish. Was she? That'd be interesting. I don't. I. I mean, she brought swimming really into yeah. um, movies. Her and what was his name? Johnny Weissmuller. Johnny Weissmuller yeah. definitely was Jewish. Yeah, look, he's got the same body I do. Got to be. <laughs> but there were other. There were a lot of other swimmers. So Lenny Kratzelberg. Um, he was obviously the best at the, 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 uh, the backstroke and he won medals in 2000, 2004. So he won four gold medals and set several records. And he's famous because he skipped after the year, after the Olympics, he skipped the national champ, the world championships in 2001 to play in the Maccabi games, which, you know, obviously is very detrimental to your professional career. If you're skipping the world championships. And uh, that's what he did. So that really endeared him to a lot of people, uh, obviously, because of that. Uh, but there's been some other great swimmers as well. Uh, Dara Torres may be the second best Jewish swimmer of all time. She, pl- she competed in five Olympic Games in swimming. That, I believe, is a record. Um, and so... What's her name? Her name was Dara, Tor- Dara Torres. She's and, and she competed in five Olympics and she skipped one. <laughs> so I think she retired her kids. So she competed in 84, 88, 92, 2000, and 2008. So, so think about that. 20, 24 years later, she was still competing and she won 12 medals. Is she American? She's American, yeah. Uh, she also won as world champion. She was, you know, she's more famous for competing in all these Olympics. Um, but there's been a lot of uh, Jewish um, swimmers as well. Now let's finish off. Anybody else have any, anybody they want to mention before we get to the last major sport we're going to talk about? Which obviously we've talked a little bit about baseball. We've talked about basketball. I'm from McAllen, Texas, so I'm not going to deal with hockey beyond Maurice Podoloff, Podoloff. Um, but the other, the most, the, the, the best, most beloved sport today in America is football. That may change in the future, but it is obviously the most famous, the most prominent today in terms of TV ratings. Nothing beats playoff games in the NFL, certainly nothing at all beats the Super Bowl. So um, when it comes to football, there have been Jewish football players. Um, oh, I forgot to mention some of the other swimmers. I'm sorry. Um, Albert Schwartz. Let's see, uh, There's been a lot of them I'm trying to think of more famous ones. There's not that many famous ones, but, um, but there's been a lot of Olympic Jewish Olympic swimmers. Um, but in football, and then we'll finish football, we'll go to Israeli. There has been a bunch of Jewish football players. Now, obviously, the stereotype is there are not that many Jewish football players. There are not that many Jewish football players in the Hall of Fame. I think there's three or four. That's it. Um, there is one all-time great Jewish football player and just one. And a couple of very prominent ones. But nothing compared to what we've done in and even baseball. Now, of course, the greatest Jewish football player of all time is, and it's not even close. Said Luck. Said Luck. Yeah, he is the the famous um, quarterback for the Chicago Bears when they were the monsters of the midway. He is in the Hall of Fame. He's considered probably one of the top 20. Yeah. He's not up there with, like, Johnny Unitas or – the guy who just retired, I just forgot his name, Tom Brody. Tom Brody? Yeah, Tom Brody. But he was a great player who led the Chicago Bears at a time where the Chicago Bears were the best team in the NFL during the 30s. Think of George Hallis. He was George Hallis's guy. Um, and there is another quarterback we'll talk about came up before him, but he was the, the best. His, father, his parents were immigrants. His father actually beat his mother to death. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, and that and that. Um, so famous. He, 
Yeah, he was one of the first, if not the first quarterback to use the forward pass and basically set record after record for force pass at Columbia, where he went to school, and then in the NFL, because, you, you know, obviously the forward pass was really didn't become really popular until the 80s and 90s. So in 1943, 14% of his passes resulted in touchdowns, which is a record that nobody's ever going to even come close to. I guess Gronkowski is not a... Uh, is he a also, player. in one year, and for those of you who like sports football, he had, in one year, 10.9 yards per attempt, which is, I think, second all time, but these days nobody even comes close to it. Um, so he led the NFL in yards per attempt seven times and passing yards three times. So he's the most valuable player. He's the first quarterback that used the T formation. And he was inducted in 1965 to the Hall of Fame. So basically the best Jewish football player of all time was in the 1930s. What is really interesting about I think that most interesting is that not only was he the best Jew, Jewish quarter, best Jewish quarterback, he's the best Chicago quarterback of all time by a large margin. <laughs> there is not a Chicago Bears That's quarterback <laughs> who's even been close since 1930, since the 30s and 40s. Oh yeah, yeah, they have had such bad. It's such bad quarterbacking that there's nobody who's even. I don't even know if he even has even made a Pro Bowl. You know, they probably give him made put made him give him Pro Bowls just to be nice. Uh, Jeff, you wanted to say something? No, 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 you're right about that. It was very interesting. Right. Like he is they're, they're I don't know if it's more interesting at how good he was or how bad the quarterbacks have been since. Well, you but can't interesting <laughs> comment that reminds me kind of like the story of Noah, you know, that he was a righteous man in his time. Yes, it's, it's exactly. It's time kind of quote, you know, with how things have changed, you know, and same, you can make that about any sport. I mean, with the uh, black and Hispanic population coming into the baseball and, uh, you know, into so many sports, basketball and football and, you know, the, the whole game, the science, the, um, you know, the training, the, uh, you know, the TV, the instant replays, the video. Oh, yeah. Games. I mean, it's, it's and the money, a, the money the involved. Money. Yeah, I mean, it's just a whole different sport. So it's so hard right. to make comparisons. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because I think I, I think he may have, uh, who knows, is it him or Nat Holman? You know, you could make more money doing other jobs. So really to be a professional athlete in most sports, you if you were coming from a prominent family or you had a college education, you probably would have going to make more money doing something else which obviously today professional sports pays a lot of money, especially for certain sports. Ron makes you said that because um, I remember we lived in Brooklyn and occasionally after school, we would get on the train and we would go down to Ebbets field and wait at the end for people to take the, um, uh, to come out and to get autographs of preacher row and Carl Ferrillo right. and those guys. And one time Carl Ferrillo even went back with us on the subway and he was a roofer. Wow. That was his job. I mean, he needed the roofing job in order right. to earn construction. And um, and you had mentioned about uh, the other day about um, oh, with the Cinderella man. Um, I forget his name. The guy James J. Boxer. Braddock. James Braddock. J. Braddock. Yeah, he worked on the New Jersey Turnpike as a construction, right. and after he retired. Yeah, you know, and he was almost guys. homeless. He was almost homeless. He's and again, his the, he made money from. Uh, Joe Lewis afterwards, that's what helped to supplement his income because he was signed, oh. signed a contract that made money from it. But yeah, so I mean, a second job. Yeah. There were exceptions like Babe Ruth who made a lot of money, but um, really they, you know, there, there was, a, you know, it was monopoly. So you couldn't really do anything. Now, as for other great Jewish players, Ron Mix is probably the second best. He was an offensive lineman. And the 60s, early 70s, he is in the Hall of Fame as well. So he would be the other one who is a, a Hall of Famer. Um, now, the other quarterback who is very famous know, is probably is Benny Friedman. He's another of the great quarterbacks. He comes into the picture 
a decade or so before um, before Luckman, and and he is famous because he was a, a did a little bit of everything, and he was I think one year led the league in yards passing and yards rushing, which has never happened since. And so it was a different age. So he was a pretty good player as well. But, you know, I don't, I don't even think he went to the Hall of Fame. I think he's in the Jewish Hall of Fame. I'm not sure if he went. I don't think he went to the NFL Hall of Fame. Um, but Julian Edelman is the you know top player right now. I think he does sort of consider himself Jewish. He's a receiver. And probably the most famous of all the Jewish players is Lyle Alzado, who was a very famous player, oh. great defensive lineman in the 70s and 80s, became very prominent because after, you know, he uh, he was a stereo, stereo steroids guy, so he got very sick, I think, from brain cancer. But uh, he was kind of the super tough maniac guy, so it's just kind of ironic that he's Jewish or was Jewish. So there also have been, of course, some coaches – in, in the in the NFL and owners. So there's you know a lot of Jews realize that football is not the safest sports. So getting into another uh, area might be good, but there's been a lot of coaches and owners. Arthur Blank obviously is the current owner of the Falcons. Al Davis, was for years and his family still owns the, the Raiders. Robert Kraft, maybe the greatest owner of all time, of course, owns the Patriots. As for coaches, Marv Levy, of course, was the great coach that led the Bills to four straight Super Bowls. I think there's a documentary that just came out of it. Art Modell was the owner of the Baltimore Ravens that won Super Bowl. Dan Snyder is the owner of the Washington Redskins. So there's been various coaches. Sid Gilman was, was Jewish as a coach. Um, so there's been various, but not, um, not as, 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 as many players who have been like what you would call great players through the year. But I think there's obvious reasons for it. You, you generally don't go into brutal sports if you have a lot of other options. So Jews who are great at boxing, that was a better option for them. Going into football today as an athlete is very problematic because a very high percentage of these players have lifetime injuries and the average career length of an NFL player, I think is three years or less than three years. So, and your first five years in the NFL, you are under a special contract coming out of college. So you don't really get to renegotiate your contract until after five years or if you happen to be really amazing and they desperately need you and you say you're going to help hold out. So, which rarely happens. So it's not as lucrative of a sport as baseball and there's the injuries. So lastly, I want to talk a little bit, just mention Israel. Obviously uh, Israel has had some um, good athletes. They have not had the great athletes, but they have gone to the Olympics now, so Israel has been going to the Olympics since they became a country in 1952, the Summer Olympics, and they've been going to the Winter Olympics since 1994. Now, Israel has never won an Olympic medal in the Winter Olympics. They did this year, didn't they? Did they this year? Maybe they did this year. I didn't hear. Oh, I'm not watching, and I'm on. I don't think so. I don't think they have. They have only. I think they only have like five or six athletes. Yeah. Now, in the uh, Summer Olympic Games, they have won a total of 13 medals. Right. But they went from 1952. It wasn't until 1992 that they won their first medal. So they went 40 years competing without making. And then 1992, they won two medals of silver and bronze. So Yael Arad is a very famous athlete in Israel because she was the first Israeli athlete to win a medal. She won a silver. She actually tied. I don't know how it works in judo, but it was actually a tie. And it wasn't like anti-Jewish or anything. It was a tie, but whatever the determining factor in the tie went to the other, wasn't because she was Jewish. It was just, that's how the rules. So I don't know what the rules are in judo, but whatever, it's kind of like a tie in soccer. And they say, whoever's had the most 
attempts at scoring or whatever. So she actually almost won the gold. Uh, there have been three golds won. And the first one was, funny enough, not so funny, in sailboarding. So or it's not actually called sailboarding. It's called um, windsurfing, I think, is what it may be called. So that was in uh, the 2004, a guy named, uh, Gal, is it, I think Guy Friedman is his name, Gal Friedman. He won the first Olympic medal. Then there were two Olympic medals in 2020. Actually, the last Olympics, um, the last ones, yeah, the last Olympics, Israel won four medals, which is more than they've ever won, double what they've ever won, including two gold in gymnastics, one in men's gymnastics, which was unbelievable, and then one in women's rhythmic uh, gymnastics. Right, rhythmic, right. And actually, the one who won the rhythmic won the overall best gymnast, which was amazing. Uh, the guy who won the floor, he won the floor, which, and then Israel, of course, won uh, uh, their first team medal i believe in judo so judo and windsurfing has judo. been their sports right. Just said that. right judo was a gold medal winner yeah actually i don't know i don't think they won one did they win yeah they won they won one gold in in um gymnastics they won one in one gold no they haven't won in, in they won one in windsurfing and two in gymnastics they've never won a gold in judo they won a silver in judo okay since Ayala Rod won the silver, they've won, a, they've won, I think, two two more bronze or three bronze. Am I? Are we uh -huh. on? Oh, okay. I'm yeah, just, you're on. Okay. After the massacre of the Israeli Olympic... Uh, yeah, I didn't want to go into that because it's so depressing. Oh, no, we talk to no, but my question was this. Was there a question in Israel whether they should go back four years later and not at all not at all in fact israel does not play that game basically if you do something to them they do not back down at all it would have been seen as a very demoralizing very weak response so they they would probably I assume they put more money into the delegation itself so they would have more athletes go just to prove. And they did hunt down and kill most of those involved. Yeah. Uh, there was a movie. They were not quite as good at it as they are today as their Mossad or CIA was still fairly infant at the time. But also there's been a movie that was not so, it didn't really, wasn't really pro-Israeli the movie. Uh, but uh, they did have a movie after it. So, and the Daniel Silva books do that whole thing, and he started it? as the assassin to the. Um, he went around the world hunting uh, the. Uh, that's not, yeah. Uh, killers. Yeah, I mean that's the policy of Israel, whether you like it or not. If you bomb a store in Israel, the next day it reopens. That's just their has always been their response. So they never, never thought, I doubt they ever even just okay. even mentioned it. They probably just pumped up their security for it. But uh, in that Olympics, actually, Mark Spitz had to leave the Olympics early. Yes. After that, they, they had to escort him and he had to leave and come back to America for his safety because he was so prominent. So that's a little bit about Jews and sports. I mean, it's a really, it's kind of fun. It's a, it's a fun thing. There's been a lot of Jews through the years have been, and it flossy. Is there any sport Jews have not really been active in? I'm sure there are. Um, I, I'm sure there are certain sports, but I can't think of any. Probably, I think it's mostly the winter sports because Jews have not tended to live in winter countries that have been very supportive of Jews. Jews did live in Russia, and so, but obviously they were not treated that well, and you don't think of Sweden and Norway and Finland as being Jewish bastions. Well, um, you see Jews in Florida and they don't have winter. Over. Yeah, you would think there probably, you know, there may have been some winter. You know, I don't, I'm not that big of a winter athlete, but I bet there's been some Jewish Canadians who have participated in the Olympics. Okay. And um, so the, I, I'm sure there've been, Jew, there've, I'm sure there've been Jews who've won medals at the Olympics and winter Olympics. I just, not an area I've, I've studied much. Did anybody else know some? I can look that up. Well, 
I, I know there are some Jewish hockey players. Yeah, Jewish hockey. That's exactly right. There is Jewish hockey. There are Jewish hockey players, and there was one I think who was on the Canadian team this year. Actually, so that's a good point. All right, I keep forgetting that hockey is a winter sport because now you know it's played indoors. So they got a hockey team in Savannah coming pretty soon. So yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For those of you who like hockey. Yeah, we're finally getting there. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, I haven't been to the end market, but I'll, I'll go as soon as COVID's over. I've, I've only seen two hockey games ever, three. I've seen the college hockey in Savannah, and then I saw a couple of games in LA, and that's the only time I've seen hockey live. And you're not hooked? No, I mean, I'm from South Texas. I still remember the day my friend, I have a friend that is from Michigan. And I was talking about how, you know, it was fun for me from South Texas to go ice skating in Houston indoors. And he told me, well, you know, I remember waking up in the morning and going ice skating when I grew up outside. And I thought he was joking. I was like, yeah, that's so stupid. <laughs> not even realizing that how can you ice skate out outside? It's not possible. <laughs> so I, That's where I come from. So. What is our class next week, Rabbi? Good question. What an apropos question and exactly where I was going. Glossy and I are the same mind, which I'm so yeah. sorry for you. That's impressive. It's not your fault. You're still a good person. Um, I, I just lost the list. Hello. There it is. Come on. There we go. All right. Next week, we are, we are doing the Apocrypha. So what I have scheduled is next week is the Apocrypha. The week after, we may do the Apocrypha again. And then we're going to have the Shanghai Jews. That's the ninth Shanghai uh, Jews? If probably, depending on how long the Apocrypha lasts. But yeah. And then after that, we had uh, the Jewish view of animals, which we just added. On the 16th? Yeah, I'll send that out. So that's what we that's as far as we've gotten. We can take another time next time and and then figure out what we want to do next. So next week we're gonna have Apocrypha, Apocrypha, Shanghai Jews, and then the Jewish view of animals. And right. uh, is the synagogue gonna be sending information about yeah, the yeah, we'll send that out. Yep. Good. We'll have Jason take a oh, I see somebody has something in the chat. Michael's not going to be in class next week. We're not having class without Michael. So let's cancel next week's class. So I want Michael to be there. Value his input. I do. Well, you guys stay safe. As always, it was awesome. And ho hopefully we can start, maybe I'm thinking maybe setting up another live monthly one starting in maybe April when things okay. come down and people feel comfortable doing it. Okay. All right, okay. guys, stay Thank safe. Very much. What, Michael? I just said thank you very much. Oh, thank you guys. Uh, I, 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 I know so much. So you guys are so knowledgeable. So